Does somebody feel like we're having some church here today? Yeah. Oh, I don't know what's the matter with the pastor. From Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at the third verse, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Here is the first reading. If you care to, please rise. For the Holy Gospel is recorded in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Beginning at the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true life, with light, which comes and gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, 
and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, Lord, open our hearts and our minds to all that you have for us, for your word is light to our hearts and our minds, and it is life to our souls. And then thank you, Lord, that we can gather together and we can worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For some reason, the Lord put four people into my life with experience growing Christmas trees this Christmas season. I had not planned to gain a degree in Christmas trees this year, but apparently the good Lord thought I needed one. And maybe you grew up on a Christmas tree farm. Is there anyone who's grown up on a Christmas tree farm or worked a Christmas tree farm? Been to a Christmas tree farm? <laughs> know that they don't grow at Walmart. <laughs> one of these gentlemen worked on a Christmas tree through high school. Another was born to a family who owned a Christmas tree farm. The other two own Christmas tree farms. Dale, that's just a little endeavor you might think about. <laughs> but there is probably a little bit more to it than you might imagine. Christmas tree growing, you see, isn't as easy as you would think. Beside planting trees for future harvest, in the blistering heat of the summer, the entire Christmas tree farm has to be mown. Those who mow use a writing mower or a gravely so they can carefully mow around each tree. Unknown to a lot of people, divots pocket the tree farm, so it's no smooth ride, no easy going. In the blazing heat, you have to wear heavy long, long sleeve shirts, or the branches will scratch you just plain raw. Then there's the bees and other sting little critters, insects, that add to the experience. Then around mid-July, once again, in heavy long sleeves in leather coverings, sharpened machetes are used to prune and shape the very tips. And they have to be shaped. They have to be cut just right. Year by year, so that the trees grow in a proper Christmas tree shape. If there weren't any seasonal workers, the entire task fell to the farmer and his family. And the same lot fell to the farmer's family when it came to the retail side, requiring great patience as each family picked their tree, and they would help them pick their trees, holding them up for them. That one's too fat. That's too scary. That one has holes. Wait a minute, can you just spin that just right? Have you heard this before? There's not enough on top on that one. That one's too short. That one's just too, too tall. Folks have no idea how much goes into a tree. See, they want perfection, including a small price tag which is why I was not able to wheel and deal when I encountered the guy selling Christmas trees down by the water tower in Chesapeake. In fact, my future daughter seated over there 
and my wife was able to get him to throw in a free tree stand. And I simply sulked away, trying to regather my pride. The two who owned farms were looking forward to seeing and selling out and retiring. And that's understandable, isn't it? The other two were happy they moved on to other jobs. I asked them both where they buy their Christmas trees. The one who worked during high school at a Christmas tree farm said, he prefers a fake one, thank you very much. <laughs> he said he became, after that experience, he himself became too picky. And his family, they, they like to put it up early, so the plastic ones work best for them. He said he gave up on a real Christmas tree years ago. I don't know if you've already tossed yours, if you have a, a live tree, but I guarantee it as early as the 26th of December going forward, if you drive through my neighborhood, it looks like CSI Christmas. Because here are all these Christmas trees in plastic bags bound with duct tape. It looks like a crime scene for Pete's sake. Well, the farmer's son told me he buys his tree at Taylor's Do It Center. He says he always picks the second one on the right, sight unseen. Whatever it looks like, short, tall, skinny, fat holes, branches, branches missing, critters popping out and everything. That's the point of Christmas, he said, and rightly so. Do Christmas trees really have to be perfect any more than we do? Does church sometimes condition us to a conditional perfectionistic attitude? See, Christ is the Father's gift to a fallen, imperfect human race in need of a Savior. So in need of a Savior that we don't even realize we need saving. He comes to us. Whatever experiences have shaped us, whatever conditions we've endured, the pruning, the droughts, whatever pests have taken up residence in our branches, whatever has broken our limbs or whatever birds have nested. Christ comes to Charlie Brown trees like us. Did you see the tree at the Rockefeller Center this year? Maybe you did. Talk about beat up. This thing was the perfect tree for 2020. It looked like it had encountered at least three hurricanes, been dropped off onto a freeway, and had several semis drive over it. It showed up at Rockefeller Center. It was the perfect tree for 2020, but it sure speaks volumes. And that's the point of Christmas. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So let's go through this again. But as many as received him, how many? Many. As many. Are you included in that many? Yeah. Am I included in that? To them he gave the right. The word there can be translated the authority to become the children of God. Or he gives the authorization or gives the power 
to become the children of God. To become what? The children of God. To those who believe in his name. Who? To those who believe in his name. And that's a really big thing. Especially when the whole matter of belief is so important to the gospel writer John. John 20, 31. Many other things did Jesus do in their midst. But these things are recorded that believing you may have life in his name. Believing. That's the whole thing. And it's not simply, oh yes, I believe, just as I believe in red lights and green lights. But that belief is an inner personal relationship with him. As many as who will receive him. As many as who hear the voice of the angels and are gathered together to worship him. Angels and wise men and all. Verse 13 says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To those who believe in his name. That's the only criteria. Belief in his name. And the word says, not of blood. It's by no other bloodline than his. And that bloodline stretches back to the beginning. As John says, in the beginning was the word. Not a bloodline based on heredity or lineage or privilege or heritage or pedigree or social or economic or theological bloodline. But a bloodline that stretches back and all who believe in his name. I was at a, an event. A tremendous pastor got up and he preached. And he got up and he said, Well, my daddy, I'm just, I'm just here to tell you that my great-grandfather, my great-grandfather was a pastor. And my grandfather was a pastor. And my father was a pastor. And I am a pastor. And my kids are going to become, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> and I followed him. And I got up. And I said, I'm here to tell you that my great grandfather was a sinner. <laughs> And my grandfather was a sinner. And my father was a sinner. Are there any other sinners in here? <laughs> oh, no, no, not me. And I'm a sinner. And we're all in need of him. And Christ's call is for those who will hear his voice and believe that he has an answer. For the sin of our lives and the sin that dwells within us. Verse 14 says, The good news is the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. God becomes flesh. News flash. God becomes flesh and dwells among us. Roman and Greek mythology is chock full of stories where the gods come to earth and mess with people and leave. Christianity is the only faith where God comes, suffers among us, and dies on a cross, and after three days rises from the dead and says these words to us, Because I live, you too shall live. Amen? Amen. Are you one of those you too? shall live because I'm one of those you twos. yeah you bet and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father 
full of grace and truth. He dwelt among us. He took up residence. He took his place. This is God 2.0. Jesus is walking, talking, acting, suffering, saving, the healing embodiment of the very Ark of the Covenant that used to have to be schlepped around by these religious Levites, one after another, carrying this thing. But now in Jesus, the Word made flesh, He tabernacled. That's what that verse there means. He tabernacled. He took up His dwelling place in human sandals, wearing human sandals, encountering the human experience. Jesus was the Word made flesh, dwelling among, among us. But when we come to believe, He takes His dwelling in us. Dwelling among us is one thing. Dwelling in us is another. The world has yet to see and encounter the power of God's people who realize their sins are fully forgiven or that they are truly God's children walking in His authority. This is so much bigger than Santa Jesus, amen? Where you hop in his lap and ask for a computer game or a stereo or maybe in your case a soda machine or another pistol. What he's waiting for is when we as his kids hop in his lap and ask him for a whole nation to come to believe. We ask for a new house, but he's just waiting for us to ask for whole neighborhoods, whole businesses to experience his life-changing, resurrecting power. Amen? Amen? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now I have a question for you. Have any of you ever seen an upside down Christmas tree? Yes. Ah, a few of you have. I hear they're actually very popular in big cities where apartments are very small. The tree is pointing down like a big arrow. And maybe that's a good reminder of the gospel that Christ comes to us, to all who will receive him. And this is the good news that the angels brought to earth. A Savior came down from heaven for us, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It's said that Martin Luther first brought an evergreen into their home one winter when his son was violently sick and couldn't go out and play. Luther's famous Christmas carol, Von Himmelhock, or otherwise known as From Heaven Above to Earth I Come. Have you, are you familiar with said song? It has no less than 15 verses. 15. We're going to sing them all right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Got the safety team here to protect the past. Have no less than 15 verses telling the Christmas story. There's a story that Luther arranged that on various verses, there would be knocks at the door during the singing of this hymn. And different students and townspeople would appear dressed as angels, then shepherds, then wise men, to the delight of Luther's many children. What a party! When everyone is invited and warmly welcomed, 
who believe and join in that song. The gospel is the good news that Christ comes to us from heaven. God's plan from the foundation of time. As John says, long, long ago, in a galaxy far away. But his version is, in the beginning was the word. My Swedish grandparents, my Swedish immigrant grandparents, told me stories from the old country. When on Epiphany night, January 6th, the family gathered for the final celebration of Christmas. The cookies that were used for decorations were eaten gladly by the children. Then the tree was carried outside with joyful hearts and much singing. You guessed it. The tree was set ablaze on their farms. Gathered faces glowed with its light. That was Christmas. I heard of one church that did the same. But they severed the top third of the trunk and then bound it and nailed it into the shape of a cross in anticipation of Good Friday. On Easter it was adorned, adorned with trumpeting lilies heralding the empty tomb. We are no more able to earn his coming for us at Christmas than we are for his rescuing us at Easter. For he accomplishes it single-handedly. And that's the point of Christmas. Amen? Amen. rise as we join together for the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 